testing. So is it clear well? Is it clear well? I don't know. Doesn't sound like they would do that. Um, and they could hear you better that way, but they, they can't because I'm not plugged in there. They can't hear you through the cord. And change the batteries in the preamp. Change the batteries. And change the cable. Any of that should have fixed any problem we had. Thing or should we just get started? Uh, do a test, Judge, and see if they can hear you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Crawford, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Judge. I just can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Excellent. That's a good sign. Okay. She said loud and clear. Let's go with that. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. We have a final plea calendar. Uh, that was supposed to start a couple minutes ago, but we're working through some technical issues. Plus, we've had another judge using this courtroom for a day or so, so all my settings got changed as well. Um, but uh, we should be good to go. Um, if you cannot hear what's going on here in court, um, please let me know, wave your hands or do something, and we'll figure out another way to uh, make it audible to you all. But all of you on Zoom, we can see and hear very clearly. So it's good on this end. It may not be great on your end hearing what's going on in court, but we'll do our best to accommodate. Um, we've got a few positions on the um, final plea calendar. I'm happy to take them in, in any particular order if um, Ms. Hall or um, one of the other prosecutors has, has spoken with an attorney and someone needs to get out of here first. Otherwise, we'll go in, in the order of the calendar, um, which has um, defendant Harris, Ron Trias, and I apologize if I mispronounced the first name, Harris, Mr. Wright's client, um, is our, our um, first position on here. Um, I see Mr. Wright. Good morning, Mr. Wright. Good morning, Your Honor. And Mr. And Mr. Harris is right behind me. All right, I see Mr. Harris. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was asking Mr. Harris how he's doing. He's doing fine. He's waving. Okay, I'll take that as he's doing fine. Um, it's all. Um, what are, what's happening today as, as far as the state is concerned with Mr. Harris's case? Good morning, Your Honor. Um, the state is actually going to request a reset for both Mr. Harris and the co-defendant, Miss Miss Herbert's case. That is with Miss Patel. Um, we still have not received our medical records back from Grady Hospital. Um, I did learn some information while um, investigating these cases that originally we thought that the, well, I thought the, the state believed that the victim was shot twice. Um, after speaking with the victim, I learned that he was shot six times, which changes the posture of our recommendations to either of these defendants, um, especially with the circumstances of this incident. I'm sorry incident um but after checking with my investigator we still have not received our medical records for me to confirm um this information that i just learned um it is important because all of our uh, reports from officers only reference two shots and two sh casings being found and um 
So this information is very different. So I'm I'm re I'm going to rely on the medical records to determine um, the severity of 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 the case based on him getting shot twice or six times. But beyond that, um, there is some other discovery that we haven't received. I did reach out to Hateville um, when this calendar was produced. I have not heard back from them. I have reached out to them um, twice since. And I did learn that the person that holds all the, or is controlling the, have the records is on vacation. Apparently she'll be back next week. Um, and that wasn't communicated to me. I haven't had a response from them, but that was communicated to one of the defense attorneys. Um, so I assume that I'll get a, um, get this information next week. But um, things were served before I touched this case last year when George Jenkins had it or another colleague in my office. Um, the defense did receive um, interviews, pictures, the lineup, 911 calls. But in reviewing that information, I um, one of the defense attorneys reached out to me and let me know that they believe there may be another 911 call that we didn't produce. Um, that's why I was checking into Hateville to see. Apparently, the one of the defendants in this case may have called 911. The 911 call that I have is the victim calling 911, not the defendant. Um, so I was checking to see if there is another 911 call because apparently officers did see that the defendant called 911 on her cell phone but we don't have any records of that. Um, as well as there was an interview that was given to defense attorneys, uh, one of the defense attorneys, Ms. Patel, that doesn't play all the way through. So again, I was reaching back out to Hateville to reproduce those interviews so that I can pass them along um, to defense. I'm assuming if hers didn't play, mine, um, mine wouldn't even open. So I, I, there may just be an issue with that um, when it was being downloaded. And then there's interviews from the victim that we were never given from Hateville. So I'm asking for a reset so that I can um, get this information, get this evidence to the defense counsels. I know this is a final plea, but um, I don't think either uh, any of us are in a position to for me to make a, a good recommendation for either of these defendants without looking at everything that happened, because apparently there are things that I need to be aware of for one of these co-defendants um, that should be in evidence that will help me make a or one of the defense attorneys feel like it'll help with my decision as far as the recommendation, but I can't do that with what I have right now. So I'm asking for a reset so that I can produce and reproduce some of the evidence that they don't have at this moment. When did you learn and how did you learn, Ms. Hall, that um, in, in this case, Mr. Mathis was shot six times instead of two times? I learned that last week um, in talking to the victim. And I will say in talking to him, he did say he's been having some memory issues. Um, but I clarified, asked more than once, he is certain how many times he was shot. It's just no reference to that in the in the report. So I just wanted to, of course, get those medical records, which we haven't gotten to verify. Um, he told me all the locations where he was shot and where it affected him. So I have no reason not to believe him. I just didn't have that in any of the reports. Um, it, have you seen anywhere that there were six shell casings or, no. okay. So no. everything you read suggests two shots, two shell casings. The indictment suggests Mr. Mathis was shot in the torso and in the abdomen. Um, it's could be shot three times in both places, but it's two counts of aggravated assault. Right. And I will say that the information that was given to officers was given to a witness who had several different stories um, of this incident. So the two shots came from his statements. Um, and I, in the police report, they did recover two shell casings and two um, bullets. But that was all that was in the report as far as what they recovered. But the two shots that was given by an actual witness that was there. So the medical records are stuck where? Grady has them. And the EMS records come, are from Hateville. Um, I'm not sure if this was an issue with our office or with Grady. I reached out to my investigator. She did order them. They was actually ordered by my initial investigator when I um, first got assigned to this courtroom. Um, they were never given to him, so she reordered them, but she hadn't checked on them. So I'm not sure if they were sent or, I mean, I'm sorry, if they were given to us and she just didn't see those. But when I did speak with her and got the update, um, 
this week, I do know that that is on Grady. Grady has not produced those, even though we have given them two subpoenas at two different times this year. So my recollection is that Grady has not been a, a, a problem. What What's different with this case than in other cases? And that's why I said that I didn't know if it was an issue with the state because they haven't been a problem um, since the pandemic. I have, I mean, I've been slowly receiving medical records. I haven't had very many, but I have received medical records during the pandemic. So um, that's why I reached out to my, I mean, my, not my supervisor, my investigator to find out what's the holdup on this particular case. And she was said she was going to actually go down to Grady to see if it would produce them faster. She didn't know, but the subpoenas were sent by her and another investigator. Mr. Wright, good morning again. Tell me what you feel like you don't have from your review of the discovery beyond the obvious, well, holy smokes, there could be four more shots involved, which seems to be news to everyone other than the alleged victim. Well, Your Honor, actually, I, I would um, also ask to reset this and actually maybe even a little farther back. I actually came into the case and I was just looking at the docket, docket in March and I think that was for the purpose of bond. Discovery had been filed prior to me by the public defender. I have a decent amount of the written discovery, incident reports, supplemental reports, case summary, but I don't have any of the digital evidence. Um, as I was getting ready for today, realizing I don't have that, uh, I then looked to see where we filed for felony motions and I don't see it. So that would explain why I did not get it directly to me. Um, I would ask for time to be able to reach out to Ms. Hall as well as the former counsel, make sure I do in fact have everything. And what she's announced to me was what I would have thought would be there, um, audio or video interviews, uh, things of that nature. So uh, I'd like to be able to go through it and depending on what's there and what's not there, um, if the court would uh, consider doing a new scheduling order for us, uh, I'll immediately review it, immediately file anything that I think is appropriate. Um, but I would ask, uh, and maybe because of the pandemic, things just sort of, this is right as it was starting uh, when I came into the case. But I, I would ask if the court would possibly grant the motion to reschedule this and also allow the defense time to respond to what's provided. Ms. Hall, I don't see Ms. Patel on the call. Had you and she discussed this, her client and, oh, Ms. Patel's right there. That's why, I, I'm trying to stay focused on this screen. Ms. Patel's right here. Uh, is Ms. Hubbard here? Um, she's not here, Your Honor. Okay, have you had contact with Ms. Hubbard? I haven't, but the number that I called, I realized um, was not her updated number. So I have to reach out to her and try to get a number that I have in my file. Ms. Hubbard has two cases. Um, this one, which is pretty serious, and another one, which is the reason why we got the shooting case. Um, when did you last have contact with Ms. Hubbard? At her last court date, Your Honor, which I believe was the I don't have it written down, but I believe it was maybe early in the spring. Okay. We had a, you filed a waiver of, there's a plea and arraignment on the 25th of February. And the very next day, you filed a um, entry of appearance and an address for um, uh I guess it's your information. You confirmed um, that her address was correct um, and you filed an entry of appearance. So um, you, I guess that's the last she was here in court? I believe there was one other time because I know that she um, came to court after being released from custody. I'll have, I don't have it written in my notes, but. Well, that may have been when, um, because her bond she posted in January, um, and uh, then you were in court, I assume she was too, I don't know whether she was in court, but you were able to confirm her address, et cetera, in late February. 
Um, tell me what you think I happen not on the benchmark side. I'll manage that, but on the discovery reset um, first with the shooting case. So your honor, just to put um, to let your honor know what all is missing, and I have not moved to exclude some of this because I believe it's exculpatory, especially after speaking with Ms. Paul and hearing the version of events the victim now has. Um, my client did make a 911 call. The detective confirmed that we are missing that. Um, her cell phone was seized and a search warrant was executed. Um, we are missing the content of that cell phone dump, which we also believe will be helpful to our defense. Um, one of the state witnesses gave two written statements that we are missing. We do not have. CID did come to the scene, took photographs. We don't have their report. Um, there, I don't know if a GBI report was generated, but I do know that they recovered the casing and two bullets. Uh, we are missing body camera footage. Uh, we have some incident location photos. Um, the shooting happened inside an apartment, and the, one of the state's witnesses started cleaning up the blood before officers had um, seized the scene appropriately. And so we're missing photographs that um, showed that there was any blood or anything inside um, because they were able to stop him. So it doesn't really give us a helpful idea to where the person was shot. Um, we're missing on the interview Ms. Um, Paul pointed out that state witness Montreal Hodges his interview cuts off after eight minutes. And so we need a complete interview on that. We do not have any interviews regarding Christopher Mathis, the victim who was interviewed at the hospital. There was also a second interview of my client that I'm missing. And then we are missing medical records. Ms. Hall, were you able to hear any of that? Um, most of it, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Ms. Patel, have you told Ms. Hall before now that you're missing all these things? Yes, it's in an email. All in an email. Okay, and that email was sent when? In April. In April. Ms. Hall, in April, you got an email uh, explaining that Ms. Patel did not have Ms. Hubbard's own statement to law enforcement. What have you done since April to try to get Ms. Hubbard's statement to law enforcement? So I, I just found out about Ms. Hubbard's state, statement recently. Um, Ms. Oh, well, Patel. Stop, stop. But you didn't just find out recently. Ms. Patel sent an email in April. April is not recently. We're in October now. That's six months ago. Again, Your Honor, I found out about her statement recently. Ms. Patel re-forwarded her email that she sent me that clearly I missed. So I just found out about that information when she resent her email, pulling it back up to the top of my emails. I apologize didn't know about it. So when I learned about it, I started to try to get that information that she didn't have. How about position three? How are you going with discovery on position three? Um, Your Honor, uh, Ms. Paul and I actually pre-tried this case and uh, we had a resolution in mind. However, I, I was just notified that Nikia Sellers will be the prosecutor. So I have been free time with the wrong person. Position three is Ms. Sellers' case. Uh, Ms. Hubbard was a, um, she was terminated from BHTC. And I believe that Ms. Sellers is keeping this case. Okay. So that is my error because I, um, Negotiate, or I work toward the negotiation and I will have to renegotiate that with Ms. Sellers. Um, I have the initial discovery packet. I don't know if um, state has 911 calls or body camera. Um, I think that this is a case that should work out, which is um, where Ms. Hall and I were, and hopefully Ms. Sellers and I can also come to some protection agreement. But so I'm clear, you had resolved position three, not position two. Correct. Okay. And uh, the reason we uh, would like to discover is that uh, in speaking with Ms. Paul, we think that there, what we might find out might be more helpful for my client's situation. 
the reason why you'd like discovery in position two. In correct. Okay. Well, you're also entitled to it in, in some of the basics of the case. All right. Um, it doesn't sound like we can do anything meaningful with um, Mr. Harris's case today. Mr. Wright, you're certainly entitled to the additional information. Um, you need to be looking at what you have already uh, to see if there are any motions you're going to file. Um, but uh, there may be materials you don't have yet that would be properly the subject of pretrial motions um, that, that you might want to file. So we're stuck um, on a case um, in which this gentleman was shot at least twice um, over a year ago. Um, All right, not a great start to today's calendar. I will get back to everyone as to what's going to happen with scheduling. Ms. Hall, you would be well served to get you and your investigators working on getting all the missing discovery that um, Ms. Patel asked for in April of this year. Um, I am going to issue a bench warrant for Ms. Hubbard. These are very, very serious charges, especially count two. Um, if Ms. Hubbard can get herself into court um, before the bench warrant catches up with her, um, I'll set it aside if there's a good basis to do so. Um, but this is not the kind of case that Ms. Hubbard or Mr. Harris should skip a court date for. Mr. Harris is where he ought to be. He's with his lawyer. No one needs to come to court if they're dialing in. Um, but uh, Ms. Hubbard is neither online um, nor in court. So, um, I don't, I don't know the mechanism, Ms. Hall, if you need to coordinate with Ms. Nelson or if Ms. Nelson generates it, but I would like to do a bench warrant for Ms. Hubbard. And then um, I'll think through what a scheduling order will look like again for the Harris Hubbard matter. Mr. Wright, anything else on behalf of Mr. Harris? No, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Harris, you remain on bond. Those conditions of bond continue to apply to you. You are to have no contact, obviously, with Mr. Mathis, um, but you're also to have no contact with Ms. Hubbard. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, we'll see you guys sometime uh, when we've got more to do with the case. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. May we be excused? Yes, you may. Thank you, Judge. All right, position four is Mr. Richmond, and that is Mr. Franklin's case and Ms. Hodge's case. I see both Mr. Franklin um, and Ms. Hodge. Um, Good morning, Your Honor. Joining us, Mr. Franklin? He's on the screen. He's uh, in the blue coat. Got it. Okay. Um, Mr. Franklin, it's final plea today. Um, what what do you think um, we're able to do today? Um, not much of anything. We received discovery earlier this week. Uh, I believe it was sent on the 8th. Um, I received it when I was in the office on Wednesday. Um, I spoke to Ms. Hodge about that, um, and I informed her that I'm finishing up a constitutional speedy um, motion. It's a 2016 incident. Uh, the case was not indicted until 2019. Uh, I believe it was March of 2019. I filed my entry and discovery requests and those kind of things um, in, I believe it was May of 2019. Miss um, Hodge hasn't been the DA on the case the entire time, but nevertheless, I've not received anything until last week um, other than an actual indictment. So. Um, I'm wrapping up a constitutional speedy motion to bring before the court. Okay. Ms. Hodge, you or someone from your office will have an opportunity to try to make a record as to why it took so long to indict and then compounding that problem, why here we are in October, um, which would be um, a year and a half after the indictment, the case was indicted in April of 2019. And uh, Mr. Richmond only now received discovery. Anything you want to share with me 
Now, on the final plea date, um, when I learned that uh, the defense just got discovery? Um, no, Your Honor, this case was on plea and arraignment earlier this year. Um, I had requested that discovery be sent. Um, at that time, it was not. I was not aware of that until I followed up in the system when I saw this case calendared. And as soon as the calendar was produced, I did ask that discovery be served to Mr. Franklin. Um, the defendant um, was in custody in another jurisdiction. I don't think he was at his original plea and arraignment date, if I remember correctly. Um, but in any event, that, that still doesn't address why Mr. Franklin did not receive discovery then. But I think the case was originally continued from that plea and arraignment. There was a plea and arraignment in June of this year. Um, he was present for that. All right. Um, I don't know why there was not a plea and arraignment till June of this year um, when it was indicted in April of last year, but I'm sure um, both sides will uh, be ready to explain that passage of 14 months when um, we are trying to account for all the months between the alleged incident, the indictment, and where we are now. So Mr. Franklin, um, you'll file your motion when you're ready. We will have an evidentiary hearing on the motion for constitutional speedy, and we will go from there. Do you have a ballpark sense of when you'll be filing it? I'm not applying any pressure? But oh, no, um, I've, I've, I'm basically done drafting. Um, I had started drafting it before I received the discovery. I'm going to give the discovery a, a pretty good read through and make sure there's not anything that needs to be included from the discovery to just to kind of flesh things out a bit more. But the, the bare bones of it is complete. Um, so next Tuesday at the worst, I think. Okay. Um, so you have had a chance to review what Ms. Hodge got you um, <clears throat> on receiving the final plea calendar. Um, did you feel like there were essential things missing from the discovery that you got? I, I haven't read it in detail at this point just yet. So I don't, okay. I, I, can't, I can't answer it just yet. I guess I misunderstood you. I thought you said you had done that just to put the finishing touches on your motion. You're saying- you're oh, no, sorry, I, I need to. I need to go through it and make sure not to add, I don't have to add anything to it. All right, well, please let Ms. Nelson know and Ms. Hodge, if when you're going through that, there's a reference to your client's statement and you don't have your client's statement. I'm not suggesting that um, Ms. Hodge didn't give you all the discovery. Um, I guess you just don't know yet, but um, that will be an additional factor to consider while we're working through a constitutional speedy, if there are um, things that are um, clearly missing from what you did receive in October of this year. All right, um, we'll let Ms. Nelson know when you filed that, and the fact that it's the docket for Mr. Richmond's case doesn't necessarily hit it on her radar, um, because we'll want to have that hearing um, sooner rather than later, so that's not an additional basis to grant the constitutional speedy that didn't move on the motion. Anything else, Mr. Franklin, um, on behalf of Mr. Richmond? No, sir. Ms. Hodge, anything else on behalf of the state in connection with Mr. Richmond's case? Yes, Your Honor. In the original bond order, which was not signed by the defendant, um, there was a reference to no contact with the victim, um, but it, it looks like uh, according to the bond order, he refused to sign that bond order, but I'm just asking the court to um, remind the defendant that he is to have no contact um, with Miss, well, her name was Stringfellow at the time, it's now Miss Kristen Roberts. Okay, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm trying to find, so it goes back to 2016. There's a block here, maybe this is, So Judge Millinder um, uh, granted a $15,000 bond 
on March 25th. Um, yeah, I don't know. There is not a defendant by, it's not a signature by the defendant. Defense counsel signed it and the assistant district attorney observed but did not consent to it. Um, it's interesting, the bond is not for all the counts in the indictment. Um, I don't know that Mr. Richmond necessarily has a bond for um, the other counts of the indictment. He, he, he does not. So he's in a no bond status as to aggravated assault with intent to rape and false imprisonment. I'm just flagging that for everyone. Um, given that those are what I would call ancillary charges to the most serious charge for which Mr. Richmond did receive a bond, um, I, I don't think that this is something that Mr. Richmond needs to worry about a bunch, but Mr. Franklin, you may want to explore with Ms. Hodge and ultimately Ms. Nelson what ought to happen on the bond front because um, the bond paperwork does not align with the charges in the indictment. If that makes sense. Understood. But uh, the important point of this, Mr. Richmond, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, Your Honor, good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, the important point um, that I need to impress upon you, you heard Ms. Hodge mention it, the bond that um, Judge Millender um, granted you in March of 2016, so four and a half years ago. Um, the main condition of that, other than stay out of trouble, which you've done, um, is to have no contact in any shape or form, direct or indirect, with the complaining witness in this case, Ms. Stringfellow, who goes by a different last name now. And I'm just um, re impressing upon you the importance of staying out of her business, okay? Absolutely. Absolutely, Your Honor. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, sounds like you understand. Um, so um, we will uh, hold off on doing anything more with Mr. Richmond's case until I get um, Mr. Franklin's motion. We'll give the state a chance to respond. If it wants to respond in writing, it may be that folks would prefer to have the evidentiary hearing and then brief it, but we'll work through that at the appropriate time. Um, uh, I thought Ms. Hodge going forward, because I know getting discovery out remains complicated given that your office um, hasn't fully reopened, um, would be uh, maybe a few weeks after you ask a paralegal or a support person to get discovery out, you make sure it's actually happened rather than assuming it did. Um, this isn't the first time this has happened, not necessarily with you, but with other ADAs where the ADA says to person X, get this done, and it doesn't get done. And now it seems like it's not necessarily wise to assume that just because you asked for it to get done, that it got done. Absolutely correct, Your Honor. Great, all right. Um, so we will see everyone on Mr. Richmond's case in connection with the motion. Uh, anything else, Ms. Hodge, uh, in connection with Mr. Richmond? No, Your Honor. Mr. Franklin? No, sir. All right. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Richmond. You're free to go. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. You have a good day. And Your Honor, if you don't have anything else, you're free to go also. Thank you. Have a great weekend. I'll give you a call when I get out of court, Mr. Richmond. Ms. Hall, I think we've handled Ms. Wen's case. Is that correct with the PTI? You're on mute. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, then let's get to Mr. Klontz. Mr. Klontz is here. Mr. Franklin, is that your client or is that Mr. Patel's client? He's my client, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, the Come on up to the table if you don't mind. That's great, you can see it right there, thank you.
And it may be in a minute I have to come up to the podium, but, but let's just kind of stay right there, okay? All right. Um, Mr. Klontz is sitting at council table, Mr. Franklin. Um, tell me what you are hoping happens with Mr. Klontz's case today. So at our prior court date, Your Honor, um, we came to an agreement on a track one referral. Well, at the time it was called a track one referral. I guess it's now just a um, deferred deferred. Track. Diversionary, diversionary, diversionary track, right. uh, diversionary track resolution for Mr. Klontz case. Um, the family B in the case. BHTC or drug court? BHTC. Okay. And what's happened? Uh, we, I, I reached out to Mr. Abrams last week and I learned that after their assessment, they determined that Mr. Klontz's needs were more than what they would be able to accommodate. Um, I reached out to Ms. Hall. We talked about it a bit. I had not had a chance to reach out to Mr. Klontz. Um, where we are at this point, um, I believe we have a virtual agreement that will um, be satisfactory to Mr. Klontz. Uh, essentially, the state is going to just be asking for him to continue to stay out of trouble. Um, I believe we settled on a period of how many months, Ms. Hall? Six. Six. And once his once he's demonstrated that um, the allegations in this instant case were out of the norm, um, they will, the state will dismiss the case. So it's uh, effectively going to be a virtual PTI with the condition being um, no more incidents like this, staying out of trouble. You'll, you can provide the wording, uh, but that would be the structure that we put in. So there's something in the docket It move the case to the dead docket. And then six months later, we'll review and Ms. Hall will be in a position to say it worked well or it didn't work well. So we're either dismissing or reinstating the charges. That is correct, Your Honor. And I will add that this is a resolution that's supported by the family also who are the complaining witnesses in the case. Um, I even believe that on scene at the incident, um, someone informed the cops that they did not want to press charges. They were just trying to get help. So would these be family members of Mr. Klontz's or? Yes. Did, okay. The alleged victim is a Terrell Harris. So that is someone connected familiarly with Mr. Klontz. Correct. Okay. Got it. Ms. Hall, um, do you see things the same way that um, Mr. Franklin does or do you have a different perspective? No, I see things the same way. Okay. Mr. Franklin, do you need to set up a time to connect with Mr. Klontz? It sounds like um, he may be hearing some of this for the first time. Is that a, a fair statement? Yes. Um, I know Ms. Patel's in court this morning. Is Ms. Patel could get um, the phone number. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I got it the last time because I thought the case was essentially over after the referral. So we didn't necessarily exchange, communicate, exchange numbers. Okay. Uh, so if Ms. Patel could get it in text to me, um, I'll reach out to him today. All right. So, Mr. Klotz, how are you doing this morning? Good. Um, I'm going to ask you to write down your phone number um, on that pad there. The young lady next to you is a colleague of your lawyer. And if you need to get the phone number from a family member, that's fine. All right, Ms. Patel, did you get the number? She's writing it. Oh, she's writing it down. So Mr. Klotz, Mr. Franklin, your lawyer, who's on the screen there, uh, he's going to call you in a little bit to talk more about your case, OK? Is that OK when you talk with him? Yeah. OK, good. Um, he and the prosecutor, the lawyer for the state, have come up with what sounds like a, a, a good plan for your case. Uh, but you need to talk to Mr. Franklin about it first, okay? So he's going to give you a call sometime soon, and um, you and he will chat, all right? Do you have any questions? 
You've been doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing good. Good. Staying safe? Yeah. Excellent. Who are you staying with? Uh, I stayed most of them by myself. Now, I had to get out and then get the fire. Okay, well, that's smart. You want to stay out of harm's way, but are you living on your at your own place? Or are you living with family? Okay, good. All right, does someone help take care of things, like get groceries? Who helps you out? Your niece. Okay, all right, well, good. Well, I'm glad someone's helping you out. Uh, Mr. Franklin will call you. You guys have talked. I may not see you again unless we just happen to be walking down the street, as long as you're staying out of trouble, okay? Ma'am, do you have a question? I don't think that the court was aware of his um, mental issue. I had, so we had got documents from the doctor, as well as we have statements from different family members and friends um, describing his character. Uh, that's all I'm trying to fight for. A lot of things he don't pretty much understand. And you can because these are doctors. Okay. No, I, I actually I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I, while I don't know the specifics, yeah. I very much appreciate what you're saying. And um, the program that we were hoping to get Mr. Quantz into um, concluded that his needs are, are, are great enough, his condition is severe enough, that even that program wouldn't work. So I agree with you. Um, and what we're trying to do is come up with a solution where as long as things go okay for Mr. Klotz for six months, we can, we can just move on. Um, and that maybe what happened here that resulted in him getting arrested and these charges was more of a misunderstanding and an accident and not the normal Mr. Klotz. Okay. Um, well, then there's, there's always more to the story than, than you first suspect. Um, but we need to be thoughtful about it. Um, and and uh, I just want to make sure that we come up with a, a smart plan. But the prosecutor um, and, and then Mr. Franklin, um, Mr. Klontz's lawyer, seem to have done just that, come up with a smart plan. So, Mr. Franklin, after you've spoken with Mr. Klontz and, and maybe his family, um, if you would coordinate with um, Ms. Hall, she's got sort of that template for a, a virtual PTI. And if you're signing it and she's signing it, and it may be that you're signing on behalf of Mr. Klontz. But if I get that, uh, if Ms. Nelson gets that, um, I'll sign that order. Um, and I, I'm comfortable with what was outlined here. Um, there may be some documentation that Ms. Patel gets from Mr. Klontz's family that they want you to have just for your file in case things don't end up going smoothly. Um, but uh, um, that Ms. Ms. Patel, and you can sort that out, okay? Yes, sir. Additionally, I just uh, told Ms. Patel, I'm gonna make sure she got the text to give the family my cell phone number, so. Okay. Just did that. Ms. Hall, anything else in connection to Mr. Klontz's case? Nothing further from the state. Okay, well, um, if you want to draft something up, if you approve it and Mr. Franklin signs it and, and maybe signs on behalf of Mr. Klontz, once he gets Mr. Klontz's approval, um, uh, then that's how we can move this case along. Okay. Understood. All right, Mr. Klontz, I appreciate you being here. Um, is Mr. Klontz free to go, Mr. Franklin, or do you need him to stick around? He's free to go. I'll reach out to him this afternoon. Um, so your call. lawyer's going to call you this afternoon with the number that, that your family member shared, okay? All right, you take care, be safe. Antonio Williams is next. That's my client. Um, I expected him to log on. We It would have been a non-negotiated plea this morning. Okay. Um, I didn't hear, did you say, had he been able to or had he been willing to log on? I expected him to be logged on at this point. Okay. Um, and you said it was going to be a non-negotiated plea? Correct. Okay. Um, he is not here in court. No Antonio Williams here. Um, what we'll do is, is wrap up the calendar. We've got two more positions. If he doesn't join us, by then, um, I'll entertain a request for a bench warrant. Um, and just as um, with Ms. Patel's client, if Mr. Williams walks on in here and is ready to go with a non-negotiated plea, we can do that in lieu of 
executing the bench warrant. But I'll sign the bench warrant as soon as it gets presented if he doesn't plug in before we wrap up. You all right with that, Ms. Hall? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, then our next position is Mr. Madrigal. Did I get it right? He is here along with his lawyer, Mr. Hendrickson. Um, this is our final plea date for Mr. Mazaku. What are we doing today, Mr. Hendrickson? Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, actually, I was going to ask the court. We met up here early. I've got some items as late as Wednesday, and I just want to make sure he understands everything. I've also been communicating with Ms. Hall, and I want to talk to him about that as well. Sure. So we, I want to be, because okay with the court, I'd like to step back out in the hall and just finish that conversation and then come back and give you the answer. Not a problem. We've got one other case. So you guys go talk. And um, we'll see what's going to happen with our final position this morning. And that would be Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson is here. And Ms. Snyder is here on the screen. Good morning, Ms. Snyder. Good morning, Judge. Mr. Thompson, why don't you come on up to that same table where you saw Mr. Quant sitting, please. Mr. Thompson has a, a co-defendant, and I got a note about the co-defendant, but I, as the code defense is not on the calendar, that may be what the note was about. I think uh, Mr. Norris uh, had been elsewhere and elsewhere caught up with him, and he is now back here. Um, hey, look who just joined us. That's Mr. Williams. All right, we'll put Mr. Williams on mute. We're going to figure out what's going to happen with Mr. Thompson's situation, and then um, we'll see what we're going to do with Mr. Williams. All right. Um, Ms. Hall, tell me what, what you understand the situation is with Mr. Thompson. The last time we was in court, um, we talked about the defense counsel giving me phone records that we needed experts to look at. I provided those phone records to my supervisor who reached out to her connect, who was the super, I mean, the uh, expert that were going to examine those phone records. He just gave, well, we've been in communication with him since we provided him those um, phone records, but um, because of his job duties, he was just able to get some findings on it this week or completing his findings on it this week. And he's co compiling his um, findings this weekend when he's in the office. So I don't have the findings that he was um, examining. So the state will be asking for a reset. So that I follow this, this is not a, oops, we didn't have discovery. Um, Ms. Snyder pro provided something that she thinks might be helpful to her clients. And you, Ms. Hall, have graciously said, all right, I'll see if I can get a uh, law enforcement expert to, to chew on it um, so that we can develop the state's perspective on whether it's neutral, helpful, or hurtful to Mr. Thompson's situation. Is that a fair summary? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay, so this, this officer or detective um, is helping out and he or she is gonna get you an answer um, in, it sounds like, the next few days. Yes. Okay. So um, I, I've got a, a couple of thoughts about how best to proceed with that. Um, let me first see. Um, so Mr. Shepard represents Mr. Norris. Is that? Yes. Okay. That's right. He, I think, was just appointed because Ms. Patel had to roll off this case, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and so we had to Someone had to get C3 appointed. That turns out to be Mr. Shepard, and he has already filed things saying I need discovery, et cetera. Um, so hopefully, um, either Ms. Patel or you, Ms. Hall, can get Mr. Shepard whatever the universe of discovery is in this case. Um, but again, that's that's for Mr. Norris, not not for Mr. Thompson. Um, have you had any conversations with Mr. Shepard yet about Mr. Norris? No, I haven't had any conversations with him. Okay. All right. Um, and Ms. But Snyder. I will say, Your, Your Honor, um, Ms. Patel did reach out to Mr. Shepard to pass along the discovery. Um, it's my understanding he hasn't responded. I still will um, get him re re reproduce all the discovery and get it to him. Um, well, I leave that up to you, whether you go through all those efforts or you just get word from him that he got everything from Ms. Patel. Ideally, that's the way the process should work so that your team isn't encumbered again. You didn't have anything to do with the fact that Mr. Norris has a new lawyer and it ought to go from Patel to Shepard and it sounds like Ms. Patel's doing what she needs to do. But however you want to handle it, if you just want to 
if it's simpler for you to know that you pushed out a whole other set to um, Mr. Shepard, that's fine. And I'm not rushing you on that. You just filed this motion to compel, which is a way of saying, could I please? He just didn't ask it that way. Get discovery. So let's make sure um, Mr. Shepard gets discovery on the Nora side of things. On the Thompson side of things, Ms. Snyder, you've got discovery. You just had discovery of your own that you're asking the state to analyze. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and then once I get their um, report, I'd like a chance to go over it with my expert. So you have your own expert? Yes, sir. He analyzed the cell phone records and that's what we gave to the state was his summary and then all of the backing data. Okay, so that they can assess the data as well. And then if, if uh, Detective so-and-so comes up with the same conclusion, that might be particularly informative to what you and Ms. Hall talk about. Yes, sir. Got it, okay. Um, so how far out does it make sense? Um, it, it sounds like with Norris, Ms. Hall, we're not quite at a reset, but he hasn't been available anyway for Ms. Patel to work with him. Now it's Mr. Sn um, uh, uh, Shepard, and he's gonna need to um, work through the discovery before he files whatever he files. Um, uh, so how much time do you want, Ms. Hall, for us to, to bump this final plea date? Um, so for me, Your Honor, I just, um, I'm thinking I'll have the reports next week. I would just reach out to my supervisor on Monday to see if he was able to complete those things. Unless he had an issue this weekend, I see, I foresee me getting those, that data next week and I will have my legal assistant make a copy from Ms. Snyder so she can either pick it up or we'll mail it out. So okay. my yeah, part, please. we'll just pick up. Okay. <laughs> so my part, probably a week, Your Honor, maybe we can have it the most. So if we, and I don't, I'm not committing Ms. Nelson, she puts together the calendars, but if we moved Mr. Thompson to a final plea calendar in mid-November, so a month from now, that sounds like enough time, um, assuming there, there, there wasn't a, a, a crisis on APD side, um, to have uh, Ms. Hall get the information to Ms. Snyder, Ms. Snyder would want to talk to her expert again, and then more importantly, um, for the two lawyers to talk about, well, what are we going to do now that we have these results? Sounds um, like a, no time for me, Your Honor. Okay, yes, well, um, this just in, Mr. Thompson is on a calendar for December 9th. So oh, that's, um, that's when we will next get together. We can get together sooner. You know, if the results of um, the cell phone analysis are, hey, we can resolve this real quickly. No need to drag it out until December 9th. Um, but he is on a calendar for December 9th. I am expecting the parties to be in a position to handle a final plea conversation. That doesn't mean you've worked the case out. It means you've either worked it out or you've agreed it's going to need to be tried. Um, if something comes up that makes that not possible, please let Ms. Nelson know. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Thompson, have you followed what I've been talking about? Yes, Your Honor. So you've got some magic cell phone records. Your lawyer has obtained an expert who chewed on them. Um, those records are now with the police. They're going to look at them as well. They've been looking at them. And then the experts are going to compare reports to see what it shows. Um, and if it's good news for you, um, that may help you sort this case out because these are pretty serious charges. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Um, Ms. Hall, anything else in connection with Mr. Thompson's case? Nothing further from the state. Ms. Snyder, um, I didn't hear you say anything about discovery. Is it safe to say you've got everything you need and now you're just waiting on getting the results of the state's experts analysis of the cell phone records? Yes, sir. Excellent. All right. So Mr. Thompson, the latest I'll see you would be December 9th, same courtroom. I'm going to come on in and maybe you choose to dial in. You and Ms. Snyder should talk about that um, so that you two have a plan, okay? All right, are you at the same address you've always been at? Yes, Your Honor. Let me just make sure so that we don't have a slip up. And so I've got a Campbellton Road address, apartment H6. That's where the mail goes. You got any questions? No, Your Honor. Okay. 
Um, well, thank you for coming down here, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Ms. Snyder and Ms. Hall. Um, that's what we'll do with Mr. Thompson's case. All right, um, Mr. Mazaku is not back in here yet, so why don't we turn back to Mr. Williams's case? Thank you, Mr. Thompson. All right. Um, so, good morning, Mr. Williams. Can you hear me? Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Franklin, your lawyer told me that you were prepared to enter a non negotiated plea, uh, meaning Mr. Franklin's going to recommend one thing, and Ms. Hall, the prosecutor, is going to recommend something different, presumably something that's more severe than what Mr. Franklin's going to recommend. Is that your understanding of what we're doing this morning? Yeah. Yes. You need to talk to Mr. Franklin first, or you you got a good feel for what what's going on? Yeah, I, I know what's going on. Okay, Mr. Franklin, are you ready? Yes, sir. We spoke about this last night. Okay, Ms. Hall, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, then let's we'll get this officially on the record. This is indictment twenty SC one seven four six six four. Mr. Williams is charged with robbery by sudden snatching and giving false information to a law enforcement officer. Um, Ms. Hall, is the state proceeding on both counts? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Williams, um, in a minute, uh, Ms. Hall is going to do most of the talking. I need to ask you a few questions first. Um, both, uh, they relate to your rights as a criminal defendant. One of your rights is to have your lawyer with you, meaning by your side, during a guilty plea. You are wherever you are right now, and Mr. Franklin is in his, uh, I don't know where he is now, it's a new background for me, but he's in his own spot. Um, do you waive your right, Mr. Williams, to have Mr. Franklin right next to you while we have this plea conversation? Like, no, no, I don't waive my right. Okay, so meaning you you want Mr. Franklin to be next to you for this? You want to be in the same spot as, as Mr. Franklin to take this plea? Or are you okay taking this plea with Mr. Franklin on, on the call with you? Yeah, I'm okay with taking it. Okay, so I got to reconcile those two answers. Um, and I did a bad job of explaining it. So you have the right, Mr. Williams, to say, I'm not going to take this plea unless Attorney Franklin is sitting right next to me. You have that right. But you can waive that right and say, you know what, I'm all right. He, he can hear me, he can see me, I can hear him and I can see him, so I'm okay going forward. Are you okay going forward with Mr. Franklin available right there on the screen? Or are you telling me you want him to be in the same room with you? I'm okay with him being on the screen. Okay. You know, Mr. Williams, that if you need to speak privately with Mr. Franklin, we can move you guys into a private chat room where no one else can hear the two of you. Will you let me know if you need that? Yeah, I'll let you know. Great. The other right that you have that I need to talk to you about is the right to be here in open court so that if you wanted the general public to be here, if you wanted family to be here, if you wanted the media to be here, you could be here in open court. You're not, you're wherever that white ceiling is and that's okay, but you have to tell me that you're okay with being in a place other than the open courtroom. Are you all right with that? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, then we're gonna go forward. Ms. Hall is gonna put you under oath in just a minute. Once you're under oath, everything you say needs to be the truth. So if you have any questions about what people are talking about, you need to let me or Mr. Franklin know, okay? Okay. All right, Ms. Hall. Thank you. Mr. Williams, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you should give in the matter currently before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I swear. You may lower your hand. Please state your true, correct, and legal name. Antonio Williams. Are you at this time taken or under the influence of any alcohol, drugs, or medicine? No. Is there any medication that you normally take that you have not been given today? No. How old are you and how far have you gone in school? 24 and up to 10th grade. Are you able to read, write, and understand the English language? 
Yes. Do you understand that you've been charged with robbery by sudden snatching and giving false information to a law enforcement officer? Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to plead either guilty or not guilty to those charges? And if you plead not guilty or remain silent, you may receive a jury trial. Yes. Have you had enough time to speak with your attorney, Mr. Franklin, about all the facts and circumstances known to you regarding the charges in this indictment, including any potential defenses? Yes. Do you need more time to discuss this case with your attorney? No. Are you satisfied with his services? Yes. Counsel, do you waive formal reading of the indictment? So waive. Do you waive any and all defects in the indictment, including with respect to the defendant's name? For purpose of this plea, yes. And do you waive moving forward on a copy of the indictment? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Williams, have you been arrested on these charges? You talking about before? Yeah, originally were you arrested? Yeah, yes. I ask because the state is unaware of any outstanding warrants that are related to these charges. Do you or your attorney know of any outstanding warrants related to these charges? We do not. Ms. Williams, have your attorney advised you of the minimum and maximum sentence to the charges that you're pleading to? Yes. The minimum and maximum for robbery by sudden snatching is one to 20 years to serve, and the maximum for giving false information to a law enforcement officer is 12 months to serve. Do you understand that if your guilty plea is a blind plea, also called a non-negotiated plea, the state will still recommend a sentence to the court? Yes. Have you discussed this offer with your attorney? Yes. The state's offer for a robbery by sudden snatching is five years to serve one balance on probation. And the state's offer for giving false information to law enforcement officer is 12 months probation plus restitution, um, the amount to be determined. But the court does not, I mean, I'm sorry, does the court do you understand that the court can impose any sentence authorized by law, including a higher sentence than that recommended by the state up to the maximum sentence for um, each charge in this indictment? Yes. Do you understand this is a guilty plea which is permanently recorded on your criminal history? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you understand that this plea may be used to enhance sentencing or other convictions in this jurisdiction, as well as other jurisdictions, including the federal courts? Yes. Do you understand if you're placed on probation of any kind, you cannot violate any criminal laws of any governmental unit or any special conditions of probation without being subject to revocation for the balance of the sentence? Yes. Do you understand you're not allowed to possess or use a firearm while on probation? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand if you're not a United States citizen, a guilty plea conviction will affect your immigration status and will result in deportation just as a conviction at trial would. And this is true regardless of any advice by your attorney or anyone else. Yes. Do you understand there may be other adverse or unfavorable consequences as a result of this guilty plea conviction, just as there would be from a conviction following a trial? For example, your guilty plea may affect the right to vote, the right to hold public office, the right to serve on a jury, the right to obtain a passport, the right to receive, possess, or transport a firearm, or the ability to obtain employment. Yes. Do you understand that by pleading guilty to a felony, if you use, receive, possess, or transport a firearm, or use a firearm in a crime, you will be guilty of a felony which may carry a sentence of one to 15 years in prison? Yes. Do you waive... Do you understand that you waive any and all defenses, including any mental health defenses, by entering a plea of guilty? Yes. Do you understand that if you went to trial, you have the right to a trial by jury, the right to see, hear, and confront witnesses called to testify against you, and the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself? Yes. Do you understand that by pleading guilty, you're giving up the following rights? The right to a trial by jury, the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself, the right to confront witnesses against you, the right to the assistance of counsel hired by you or to court appointed counsel, the right to the presumption of innocence, the right to testify on your own behalf and to present other evidence, the right to subpoena witnesses and compel the production of evidence, the right to have the charges against you proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and the right to appeal if convicted of these charges after a trial. Yes. Has anyone forced, threatened, or promised you anything to get you to enter a guilty plea today? No. 
Is it your decision to waive these rights and enter a guilty plea because you're in fact guilty? This plea is a going to be tendered as an alpha plea. Um, Mr. Williams, are you pleading guilty because you have decided that it's in your best interest to do so? Um, whatever my lawyer just said. Well, um, your lawyer said what he said. Ms. Um, Hall asked a question that translates offer plea into uh, English you and I might understand. Are you entering this plea, Mr. Williams, not because you're admitting, hey, I robbed guy who pulled a gun on you, Christian Todd, um, and gave a false name to law enforcement. I'm entering this plea because I think it's the best way to sort this situation out, and I'd like to move on. Yes, that's what it is. Okay. Um, you and I will talk a little bit more about an offer plea, but I think that addresses um, Ms. Hall's question. Um, Mr. Franklin, is it an offer plea to both counts? And you can explain but it's sort of on or off if Mr. Williams told police his name is Anthony Watkins. I no, it's, all, it's, it's only as to the robbery. Okay, so only as to the robbery. And I'm remembering more about this case. I understand that and we'll get more on the record about that. Okay. Mr. Williams, how do you plead to the charges of robbery by sudden snatching and giving false information to a law enforcement officer in indictment number 20SC174? Six six four. Guilty. Is this guilty plea freely and voluntarily given with full knowledge of the charges against you? Yes. Do you understand that you only have a limited right to appeal this guilty plea conviction? Yes. Do you understand that you only have 12 months from today for a misdemeanor charge and four years from today for a felony charge to file a habeas corpus petition challenging the voluntariness of this guilty plea? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, the state is unaware of any prior felony convictions by the defendant. And had this case proceeded to trial, the state would have proven that on January, I'm sorry. Um, one moment, Your Honor. January 18th. Yeah, mine says 17. On January the 18th, 20, 2020, um, at 3393 Lenox Road, Northeast Atlanta, Georgia, and Fulton County. Um, sorry, Your Honor. On on that on that day, um, the two victims were walking through the mall. The defendant asked um, one of the victims, who is now cross defendants, if he could take a picture with one of them. At that point, when he went to lean in and take a picture, he snatched the victim's necklace from his neck and took off running through the mall. Um, the victim, along with his bodyguard or friend, um, chased the defendant through the mall um, with their guns out and in their hands. Eventually, they encountered the defendant in the parking lot of the Lenox Mall, where they made him strip naked to try to locate that necklace that he snatched. Um, in, during When that incident was going on, a sergeant from APD was walking through the garage at the same time that they were trying to recover this necklace. He thought that there was an active armed robbery going on. He shot um, one of the victims in the leg. Um, well, he actually shot in the garage maybe four or five times, but one of the, the defendants at that time, victims, was shot in the leg. Both of those victims were also charged in this case. Um, with Mr. William being the, the victim for the aggravated assault. Um, when the officers talked to the defendant who was transported to Grady or the hospital, um, he did give them um, the, a different name than his own, Antonio Watkins. They did eventually find out that his real name was Antonio Williams. Um, in researching this case, the state doesn't believe that there was anybody else that interfered or took a snatched this necklace from the victim's neck. We did receive video evidence that wasn't as clear as we wanted it to be, but um, it, it did show the defendant running um, from these individuals. And um, there were times where the investigator tried to point out um, things that I couldn't quite see. There was one time I did see what I thought could have been a necklace, but again, it wasn't clear. Um, there was something in his hand, but um, that's what it was. What really um, honed this case in was a jail call that was given to defense that was produced from the investigations from APD, 
where there were conversations um, from him and his friend where they were talking about the incident. And um, that's how we are here. Um, the reason why the offer is 5-1 because of everything that happened, we do understand this defendant does not have a record. However, uh, and no one was actually, other than, I'm sorry, no one was severely injured. The victim in the um, other case who is now a defendant in Judge Krause's courtroom, he did uh, recover from his injuries. I asked for the restitution to be to be determined because I did get a number from the investigator, which is $10,000. However, I have not been able to confirm that amount through um, the victim who I can't make contact with. He has an attorney, Mr. Drew Finley. Um, so I'm trying to confirm that necklace amount through him. Um, I do believe that this defendant should be responsible for um, the restitution of that necklace and, um, you know, face the consequences of some of the aftermath that he created from just the, I mean, the snatching of this necklace. That is all from the state, Your Honor. Can you elaborate a little bit on the jail call? The jail call you felt incriminated Mr. Williams or it exonerated Mr. Williams? I felt I felt like it incriminated him. Um, I, well, the state never had a, a issue of thinking that this was what happened or what was reported was what happened in the defendant taking the necklace, but the defense and the defendant had a different in, a different story. So. Um, even with everything that was provided, they still stuck to that same story until I came across this jail call where there's a friend talking to the defendant and the friend says on the jail call, when you snatched that um, man stuff, it was some language I wouldn't repeat, but it, when you snatched it, I took off running like there, he, he recounted or he re, um, he re he reads told the story as to what happened and the defendant is on the jail call and he's agreeing he's not saying oh no i didn't snatch it he was like yeah i was looking for you so it was more of a confirmation that he did do it and when i did provide that to defense counsel um that did bring us here so um we just can't agree on probation which will be normal but with everything that happened um in this case we are at jail time for him as okay. a recommendation Got it. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Crawford, do you have any adult criminal history for Mr. Williams? Judge, Mr. William, Williams does not have any criminal history. Okay. Mr. Franklin, I didn't hear anyone talk about first offender. I don't know if that's a point of disagreement or, or what, but I've heard about Alford, which you can explain in light of the jail call. Um, but I didn't hear anything about first offender. Uh, the first offender was going to be part of my request as I made my argument. Okay. Well, why don't you make your argument? All right. So um, uh, to begin, our request is for probation. Uh, Mr. Williams is uh, from, and he's currently in Michigan. Um, as it pertains to the actual evidence uh, as viewed by the state, the video from the mall, of course, is not clear um, as Ms. Uh, Hall got into. She explained how the officer attempted to say that, hey, you can see this in his hand in this particular part of the video, um, which is entirely not clear. And I would say I didn't see what he pretended to see and tried to inform Ms. Hall of. Additionally, um, the phone call that I listened to doesn't say anything about the snatch. The first thing the guy says is, man, you should have ran out. You know, like, and it's, it's muttering. And what the account is, is an accounting of Mr. Williams maybe should have run, should have ran a different way and how they had to run about around a Starbucks, which we saw in the video. So it's a recounting of the, the chase. It's not a recounting of a snatch. Um, there is a portion where... Um, so the guy says, you know, you were standing next to Chris, which I didn't know that meant the the complaining witnesses in this case, both of them are named Christian or Chris. I didn't know they were meaning that, but it turns out there was a person with my client whose name is Chris as well. Um, in addition, so the there's about four people who are, I guess I would say with Mr. Williams' party. There's another group of people who are kind of close to this entire thing because the gentleman in this case is a celebrity of some level. Um, he's a. Is, is it Christian Todd or is it Christian Evelyn, who is the celebrity who required an armed bodyguard? 
Christian and Todd is the celebrity, the rapper. His rapper name is 2K. 2K. And he's the one who can afford Drew Finley. Yes. Okay. Got it. And he's uh, the one who was wearing the $10,000 necklace. Yes, that I haven't been able to confirm. Because the, right. the investigator, he was going off of not looking at his notes, but trying to remember what was said in the interview with the victim. And, and we have Mr. Williams who is standing basically just in his underpants in the garage and there's no necklace anywhere. That is correct, Your Honor. There, there's no necklace found on him, but I don't know if Mr. Franklin didn't quite listen to the entire call, but they, the, the friend who talks about Chris, who's standing there, who's scary, and he doesn't know why he even was next to his, his defendant, the defendant, he, he, definitely, he was, definitely says was, that- Mr. Williams, what? He definitely says, when you snatched that man's shit, I, you took off running this way. So he definitely recounted him, the defendant, taking um, the necklace. And the defendant never said, oh, I didn't snatch it. I didn't. He never. He went on with the conversation, and they can t- continue to talk about the events. All right. Um, I, I interrupted you, Mr. Franklin. I appreciate that additional detail, Ms. Hall. That you, you were, I, I interrupted you by asking which one was the, the mobile. Right. And that's Mr. Todd. Um, the, and the other thing that I will add on that I think goes towards corroborating our version of events is this chase. So what leads to the actual chase is that when someone snatches the chain, guns come out. I think you, I think Ms. Hall, I think I, we know that Mr. Williams ran <laughs> because a gun was pulled out. Um, and in the videos we can see, like there, there's no video of the point in time where the snatching is supposed to have occurred there's another angle and you can see other people in the mall just kind of start looking at a certain direction. And, and then you start seeing people run. Um, we believe Mr. Williams, of course, is the first one. And you start seeing like a trail of other guys, three or four, maybe five, all kind of follow in this line of chase. He's never out of the view of the people who had the chain snatch. He's like, if, if he had a chain and dropped it, it especially a chain that supposedly cost $10,000, that would be of some size. Um, if he's a rapper, I, I have this stereotype of what the chain may look like in my head. It's not going to be an itty bitty chain. It's going to be something of some kind of, you know, substance or weight. It's something I would think that would be seen and dropped as opposed to it would be dropped and nobody noticed it, or it would be found on this person. And where I believe that, uh, 2K and his bodyguard, I believe that they believe that Mr. Williams is the person who snatched the necklace. I think that because it's a bunch of people around and that's involved in the picture, they, they are convinced uh, incorrectly of who actually did what. And the fact that the recommendation is somewhat based um, on kind of how everything ended, like there's, this, there's a shooting. Um, and I think the, the court is aware that um, you know, my, my opinion on those t- kind of matters, but I think that under the circumstances, it's an odd argument for me to make, but the officer saw someone being held at gunpoint and he reacted. Um, it wasn't a case where it wasn't a weapon involved or some pepper spray or something like that. It was, he saw an actual weapon and he responded immediately, which again, Mr. Williams did not produce a weapon. He did not do anything to cause a weapon to be produced. Um, and I don't think that the, <clears throat> the behavior that he is accused of being engaged in is such that you would expect that a police officer would eventually shoot somebody in a parking lot after being stripped down naked. So even to the extent that the state, the state um, state's recollection of things is accurate, I still don't think it rises to the circumstances for a person who has no record um, to be given a a, um, prison sentence. Um, Additionally, because he lives out of state, he was he was down here at the time visiting family. His family lives in Dunwoody. We would also offer that a condition of probation be that he not return to Fulton County for the term of his probation. How would he visit family in in, in, is Dunwoody to cab Dunwoody or? Okay. So the, the airports in Clayton County, he would, as opposed to driving through the city up 85 to get the Dunwoody, he would just have to take 285 
around the east side, which will take them through Clayton, up through DeKalb. Mr. Williams, what family is here in Dunwoody? He's on mute. You're on mute. Cousins, my cousins. It's your cousins? Yeah, from my mother's side. How often do you see your cousins? A lot. Like, I just left from down there last week. It was his birthday. How do you get – where are you in Michigan? Flint. How do you get from Flint to Atlanta? Either I drive or fly. It's only a 10-hour drive. Okay. Are you working? Yeah, I work, with, I work for my cousin. Your cousin in Dunwoody? No, I Flint, Michigan. He got a construction uh, company. So you do construction work? Yes, sir. I really just tear down houses. Okay, so you're a demolition guy um, in Flint. Yes. Okay. So when this happened, Mr. Williams, were you at the mall with people you knew or were you yeah. there solo? So I was there with like five other people that I knew, including my cousin who, who stayed all there. You're done with each other. Yes. Were you with someone named Chris? Was someone in your group of five named Chris? Yes. Is that your cousin? No, that's his friend. Okay. And then there were a couple other guys. Did you know all of them or did you just know your cousin? I, I really just met them. That's them his friends from school. They had all came down there and started visiting him because he just moved to Atlanta. He originally from Flint, Michigan. Okay. All right. And you're at, this is Lennox Mall or Phipps Plaza? Lennox Mall. So you're at Lennox Mall. You guys see 2K and someone wants to get a picture with him? Yeah, I mean, we always want to go get a picture with him too, so... That's why we went over there with him. But, yeah, it was other people trying to get a picture, too. Okay. But, I mean, you recognized who that was? No, the people that I was with recognized him. Okay. And and folks wanted to get a picture with him? Yeah, I didn't really know too much of who he was, for real. Okay. So then what happened? Uh, we walked over there and uh, was finna take a picture. As soon as we were finna take a picture, we see the other the the other dude, not two K, pull a gun out. But we, I mean, I felt somebody bump me, but I saw him pull a gun out. So we started running, and once we started running, I seen him behind me, the one who I saw pull the gun out. He was behind me chasing me. So they chased me all the way down to the um to the um under where we was at. And they asked me where the chain was at. I'm like, I don't got the chain. I don't got the chain. I started emptying out my pockets. And then after I emptied out my pockets, I ran. I ran again. Then I, I had got tired. So I stopped. Then they told me to just strip. So after that, I just started taking my stuff off. Taking my, and then once when I got. Day, when you say they, was it 2K and his little bodyguard guy or just the bodyguard guy? Yeah. It was both of them. It was 2K and the. Uh, the light skinned dude, yeah, they had both had me at gunpoint. Told me to take my stuff off. I took my stuff off, and then that's where somebody said freeze. Okay, hey, okay, I'm gonna stop you for a sec. Um, both guys had a gun, or just the light skinned guy? Yeah, they both had guns. They both pulled them out of the ball. And when you ran, Chris and your cousin, they didn't run with you. They ran somewhere else. Yeah, they ran a different way. That's why my cousin was to ask me, like, why was I standing by him? I should have ran a different way. Okay. All right. You can see on the video, there's a bunch of people who follow. There's, there's Mr. Williams, two people I assume to be 2K and his friend, and there's some other people who are behind them at some point, but they're not, they're not speeding. They're running, but not as fast. Mr. Williams, when you come to Dunwoody um, to see your cousin, is that – Always just for family reasons, or are you also working when you're down here? It's just family reasons. Does your cousin ever come to you in Flint? Yeah, he comes to me all the time. We, we always travel back and forth. 
Because my birthday was just three weeks ago before his. Okay. Um, and your cousin in Dunwoody, what kind of work does he do? Bro, I don't think he's working right now, but his girlfriend works, I think, at Kroger. I mean, at one of the grocery stores down there. Okay. Um, is most of your family in Flint or most of your family is here in Georgia? Both. Uh, my mom's family originally from LaGrange, Georgia, so I got a lot of family in Georgia. Like half of my family on my mom's side is from Georgia. Do you still have family down in LaGrange? Yes, yes. The cousin in Dunwoody, is that on your mom's side or your dad's side? My mom's side. Well, I mean, he on both because my mother and my uh my mother and his mother is cousins, and my daddy and his dad is actually real brothers. So we cousin on both sides. All right. There you have it. Um, has Mr. Franklin talked to you about what first offender means? Yes. I have to cover it with you as well. Um, if I sentence you as a first offender, it means that this is not a conviction. You'll have a sentence, um, and as long as you're under sentence, you'll need to comply with the conditions of your sentence, but it's not a conviction. So if you are trying to find a different construction job or doing something else, and filling out an application and it asks, are you a felon? The answer, the truthful answer is no, you're not, uh, because you don't have a conviction. And okay. the first offender is that while you're under sentence, there's no conviction, and even better, if you successfully complete your sentence, Nope, you got a clean record. Um, there is not a conviction on your record, which will help if you decide you want to go back to school, if you're ever trying to get a job not with your cousin or your family and may need to fill out an application. That'll help. That's the good part of first offender. There is a risk, though. If you end up uh, getting mixed up in uh, famous rappers' necklace being stolen and guns being drawn and you get arrested again and you get indicted, um, not only do you have new charges that you have to deal with, it doesn't have to be that. You just get busted for anything. You have new charges. You could have your first offender status taken away. And without a trial, you get a hearing, you have a lawyer, but there wouldn't be a trial. Um, the judge could resentence you because you've already pled, could resentence you up to the maximum, which in this case is 21 years. So, worst, worst scenario. Um, you, if you, you caught new charges, came back in front of me, and I thought, dang, these are pretty serious charges. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with your new case, but I can tell you what's happening with your old case. I can sentence you to, to 21 years. Um, that's the downside. Now, if you know you're not going to get mixed up in this kind of nonsense, and, and you, you're 24 and you got a clean record other than this, first offender is a good deal. Um, but if you aren't so sure what's going to be going on in the next few years in your life, first offender could be a little risky. Do you understand the pros and the cons of first offender? Yes, sir. You want to be sentenced as a first offender? Yes, sir. You say yes or no? Yes. The offer plea we talked about a little bit, but we need to do it again. An offer plea is essentially when a defendant says, I don't agree with everything the state said. It sounds like you did give a fake name to the police, but the rest of the stuff I've now heard real clearly your version of events, which is, yeah, I ran, but I didn't take this guy's necklace. The state believes otherwise. They heard the phone call, they do these other things, and I understand the state's perspective. You're saying, I'm going to plead guilty anyway because I want to put this behind me, but I don't agree with everything the state has to say. Um, does that describe your situation? Right, yeah. Okay. Mr. Franklin, is there anything else you wanted to add in connection with Mr. Williams's case before I accept the plea and impose sentence? No, sir. Mr. Williams, anything else you think I ought to know before I go forward? No, sir. All right. So, Mr. Williams, I do find there's a factual basis for your plea. I understand that, that um, your contention is well, you were right up there with 2K and his uh, bodyguard and, and you think maybe someone did take his necklace. You're not the guy who took the necklace. 
And if it happened, you had nothing to do with it. It wasn't a plan of you and Chris and, and your cousin. That, that's what you have to say. Um, I not from the state that I believe that if this went to trial, the jury could decide otherwise. So I understand why you want to proceed with an offer of plea rather than take it to trial. Uh, but there is a factual basis for your plea. I also find that your plea is knowing and voluntary. Knowing means you've understood all the things we talked about. Is that correct? Yes. Any questions so far? No, sir. Voluntary means that uh, no one's forced you to enter this plea, but that you've decided after talking with Mr. Franklin and thinking about it, that this is the right way to move forward. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Franklin, how do you envision the probated part of your client's sentence working out? Um, he's in Michigan, he's not in Georgia. Uh, he's gonna need to sign up. It takes a little while for supervision to be transferred, assuming that Michigan would accept it. How are we gonna work the logistics? Logistically, my understanding is that there's usually just this initial visit. I'm not sure if they're doing that in person or virtually right now, but that the first one has to be done here and then that it'll transfer through interstate compact. I'm gonna say fairly immediately. Um, I know I've had several clients from out of state plead and I'm not aware that they've had to come back several times to get it set up. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Crawford can provide a bit of insight in terms of how that process looks today. She's next. Ms. Crawford, how might this work if Mr. Williams' home base is Flint? Um, he would come back at least once to sign up and this and that. Does he have to stay with his cousin until everything gets blessed or, or how might this be handled? Initially, Judge, he's supposed to report the next morning to um, probation and have all of his information so that they can put it in and he would need to stay until it's processed. So is he in Michigan now or is he in Georgia? He's in Michigan, he's in Michigan right, right, now. right now. He's calling us live from Flint. Yeah, he was, he's supposed to be. So since today is Friday, he would need to be um, at probation on Tuesday. Well, well, we'll work through that in a minute um, and figure out when realistically Mr. Williams can get here. I may delay signing the sentence if this goes forward, non negotiated plea. But um, assuming we set a date for Mr. Williams to be here to report to probation and, and spill out paperwork, does he then have to stay? in Fulton County until it gets transferred? Or if you're able to, if someone is able to verify the address, can he then return to Flint to be there until everything sorts out? He'll need to stay until it's verified and transferred, which doesn't take, I think sometimes three to four days, not, not very long. Okay, all right. Mr. Williams, um, assuming we sort out something that works with your schedule, are you able to stay with your cousin in Dunwoody um, or family down in LaGrange for a few days while probation does what it needs to do to transfer things to Michigan? Yes. Okay. Um, how soon could you make it back to Atlanta? I could be there um, by Monday. Okay. Then it sounds like we can work through this. Mr. Williams, I've accepted your plea. I'm sentencing you pursuant to what's called the Probation Options Management Act. And all that means is that while you're on probation, which you will be for a while, um, if you have a minor violation, we call it a technical violation, maybe you miss a meeting with a probation officer, probation will sort that out with you. I don't have to get involved. But if you catch new charges, if it's something serious like that, then that comes back in front of me and we will work through whatever the consequences are gonna be. Uh, Ms. Hall, you explained to me that your ability to communicate with the victim is a little hamstrung because um, uh, 2K is represented by Mr. Finling and you'd have to speak through him, is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, you may have already covered this, Ms. Hall, but um, Mr. Franklin, do you waive um, or do you authorize us to proceed with a copy of the indictment rather than the original? Yes, sir. Mr. Williams, I'm going to sentence you as follows. Your sentence on count one is going to be five years. I'm going to probate those five. How long were you in jail as a result of this? Oh, uh, 
four days. Okay. Um, your sentence is going to be five years to serve, but they will be served on probation. Your sentence for count two is going to be four days to serve, but you'll get credit for the days that you were in. So your total sentence is going to be five years on probation. Um, I will support the application to have your probation transferred to um, Michigan, assuming you can document that's where you live. And I assume you can because that's where you are now. <laughs> um, it will be a special condition of your probation. That means it runs the whole term of probation. And if you violate it, um, you could have all of your probation revoked. Um, that you stay out of Fulton County. So that's Lenox Mall, that's Phipps. That's Atlantic Station. Um, it is mostly inside the perimeter, although um, uh, Fulton extends a little north uh, and a little south. But you need to stay out of Fulton County. If you get stopped in Fulton County, that would be a basis to revoke your probation. Um, mostly just keep you out of those malls um, where it seems like too often unfortunate situations like this happen. Um, and someone got shot. I'm glad that whether it was 2K or his bodyguard, that that person is okay. It could have ended much worse. You could have gotten shot, whether by those goofballs or by an officer. And um, that would have been um, real unfortunate. So um, you'll need to stay out of Fulton County. Um, you will need to report to probation. What was the day? Was it Tuesday, Ms. Crawford? On Tuesday, yes. I'm going yeah. to get some information from him um, in a breakout room once you're done. Yeah, I'll send him and Mr. Franklin there. Uh, but that's Tuesday, October 20th. So I know you were just here. You may be a little weary of Georgia, but you're going to need to truck on back here, drive or fly, um, so that you report to probation. If you do not report to probation on Tuesday the 20th, I will sign a warrant for you. Um, once you report to probation, you can start that whole process of getting things transferred to Michigan so you don't have to stay in Georgia. But until your probation is transferred to Michigan, you got to be with either your cousin in Delwoody or your family in LaGrange. You can pick which one. Um, you'll just need to let Fulton probation know that. And they'll push it either to DeKalb or Muskogee. I don't know what county LaGrange is in, but whatever county it is, that's where you'll be supervised. Um, I think that's it. Do you have any other conditions? I know you mentioned restitution, Ms. Hall. I'm not going to say anything about restitution. If that resurfaces and you want a petition for a sentence modification, we can have a hearing on that. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, I'm uh, going to leave that alone based on, on what you've got. Um, no, no other additions, Your Honor. Okay. And thank you. Uh, just, just so we're clear, um, your total sentence is technically five years and four days, Mr. Williams, but you've already done four days and now it's five years probation following that. Um, Mr. Franklin, did you have anything else on behalf of Mr. Williams? No, sir. I don't think the sentence I imposed is structurally more severe than what you asked for. So I don't think he has a right to withdraw his plea. Um, but if you need to talk to him about that, I guess when you guys are in the breakout room with Ms. Crawford, you, you can let me know. The last thing I've got, unless you have any, do you have any questions, Mr. Williams? No, sir. I mean, yeah, I do. Like, is it a way that, like, I can shorten the time, five years, like, while I'm doing the probation? Sure. Um, if you are doing, I don't know how Michigan works. I can tell you how Georgia works. If you are doing well on probation, um, after a few years, it becomes non-reporting. Um, and it's also possible after a few years that you could petition to have the rest of the sentence suspended if things are going well. Uh, Michigan may be very much like that. I, I, I don't know. Um, that would be a question for you to ask folks in Michigan when you get settled back there, okay? Okay. But I'll tell you this, I, I can add this much at least. If you're doing fine after a couple of years, you stayed out of trouble, no incidents at malls, you've just been working, taking care of family and whatnot, um, I, I support the notion of getting folks off probation. Those folks, probation, 
They ought to be focused on the knuckleheads who are creating trouble, testing positive, running and gunning, getting caught shoplifting. If you're just working and doing the right thing, um, we don't need to fuck probation with that. So the answer is if you're doing well, most likely you can shorten it, but that's on you, okay? Uh, yeah, okay. All right, last thing from me, then I'm gonna put the three of you, Ms. Crawford, Mr. Franklin, and Mr. Williams in a breakout room. Um, Mr. Williams, if you were here in court, you would sign your um, indictment saying I'm pleading guilty to the offer to count one. But you're not there. Do you authorize me, Mr. Williams, to sign the indictment for you? Yes. Mr. Franklin? Yes, sir. And Ms. Hall? Yes, Your Honor. All right. I am going to move the three of you that I just mentioned to a breakout room. Mr. Williams, Ms. Crawford's going to need to get all sorts of address information from you. Probably your address in Flint, but more importantly, your cousin's address in Dunwoody. You guys talk about that. When you're done, you're free to go, Mr. Williams. Uh, Ms. Crawford will need to come back here. Mr. Franklin, I think you're done for this morning as well, if not for the whole day. So you're welcome to come back, but you're free to go. And if I don't see you, have a good weekend. You too, sir. All right, let's try this breakout room thing. Oops, wrong button. Yes, sir. All right, you should get the prompt. Great, you did it. You're still here, Mr. Teller. Um, I was under the impression the seller's mic going to call um, for Ms. Hubbard, but I have made my announcement. Okay, and Ms. Hubbard has not made her appearance. Correct. Okay. So, um, I, I don't know if Ms. Sellers knows to be here. She has not joined. Um, but uh, Ms. Ms. I was going to cover for Ms. Sellers because she had Veterans Court, Your Honor. Okay. So, so I let her know that we were resetting. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think that's it for Mr. Williams, and that brings us to Mr. Masco. So why don't you come out, Mr. Hendrickson, and let us know what we're going to do uh, and you think we're going to do from the defense side. Judge, um, we have been talking, and I appreciate the court allowing us a little bit of time to step outside uh, and speaking with or texting with Ms. Hall and talking with my client. I think we have a negotiated resolution for your honor here this morning. Great. So um, should we get Mr. Masky to come up as well? The only question, I didn't know if there was, every jurisdiction I'm in is different. I didn't know if I had to fill out the paperwork. It looked like you've been doing most of the paperwork. There, but if I need to sign something out the hallway, I can take down do that. But I no, I appreciate that. We we do have a plea form that in normal times I would have you fill out that would be a belt and suspenders version of what Miss Hall covers, uh, just so it's in writing and you sign it. Client has we have waived that requirement, and it's a me requirement, not a Georgia requirement during these more complicated times. So if you and Mr. Masku are ready, he should come on up. And um, uh, Ms. Hall, do you feel like you know the contours of what Mr. Hendrickson has in mind? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. Then um, are you good to go, Mr. Forte, or do you need a break? You're good, Judge. Okay, then we'll, we'll get started. Um, this is position eight. It's 20 SC 174728, State versus Jeff from I'm familiar with this case. We're <laughs> taking a plea with your co defendant, Mr. Willibus. B-U-S, familiar with Ms. Wen, um, but we're going to make this official and we'll make the record we need to make. Mr. Mazaku, um, in a moment, Ms. Hall is going to place you under oath. Once you're under oath, it's important that you answer all of her questions and mine truthfully and completely. So if anything we ask you is confusing or it's just not what you were expecting based on your conversation with Mr. Henriksen, will you let him, Mr. Henriksen, or me, no, that you've got a question? Yes, sir. Great. All right. You may need to speak up a little bit so Ms. Hall can hear you. I can hear you, and, and Mr. Forte, the court reporter, can, but Ms. Hall's going to need to hear you as well. Ms. Hall, when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Um, for the record, the state is no processing counts one, two, three, and five, which are armed robbery, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, aggravated assault, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. And so, we'll be amending. I'm sorry. You're proceeding with count four as it's charged? No, we're going to amend count four to theft by receiving stolen property. And will that be a felony theft or a misdemeanor theft? It'll be a felony theft. Okay. Um, Mr. Mazakew, can you raise, please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you should give in the matter currently before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. You may lower your hand. Please state your true, correct, and legal name. Jeffrey Chris Mazakew. Are you at this time taken or under the influence of any alcohol, drugs, or medicine? No. Is there any medication that you normally take that you have not been given today? No. How old are you and how far have you gone in school? I'm 22 and uh, I'm currently in college right now. And are you able to read, write, and understand the English language? Yes. Do you understand that you've been charged with criminal damage to property in the first degree being amended by the state to theft by receiving stolen property? Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to plead either guilty or not guilty to that charge? And if you plead not guilty or remain silent, you may receive a jury trial. Yes. Have you had enough time to speak with your attorney about all the facts and circumstances known to you regarding the charges in this indictment, including any potential defenses? Yes. Do you need more time to discuss this case with your attorney? No. Are you satisfied with his services? Yes. Counsel, do you waive formal reading of the indictment? We still waive. Do you waive any and all defects in the indictment, including with respect to the defendant's name? We do as well. And do you waive moving forward on a copy of the indictment? I'm sorry, I missed that one, Ms. Hall. I'm sorry. Do you, um, do you waive moving forward on a copy of the indictment? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Mazakew, have you been arrested on this charge? Like when the indictment came out or before? Originally. Did you ever get arrested in connection with this case? Oh, okay. Um, I'm asked, I asked because the state is unaware of any outstanding warrants that are related to these charges. Do you or your attorney know of any outstanding warrants related to this charge? No. Has your attorney advised you of the minimum and maximum sentence to the charge that you're pleading to? Yes. The minimum and maximum sentence for theft by receiving stolen property and the amount that um, was taken here is one to five years to serve. Do you understand that this is a negotiated plea of guilty, which means the state will recommend to the court a sentence of three years probation plus restitution in the amount of $1,500 to be paid to the victim, but the court does not have to accept that recommendation. The court can sentence you to the maximum on this charge, which is the five years to serve. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand this is a guilty plea which is permanently recorded on your criminal history? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, my apologies. I um, just disregard that question because I understand this is a first offender plea. Um, do you understand this plea may be used to enhance um, sentencing on other convictions in this jurisdiction as well as other jurisdictions, including the federal courts? Yes. Do you understand if you're placed on probation of any kind, you cannot violate any criminal laws of any governmental unit or any special conditions of probation without being subject to revocation for the balance of the sentence? Yes. Do you understand that you're not allowed to possess a firearm, possess or use a firearm while on probation? Yes. Do you understand if you're not a United States citizen, a guilty plea conviction will affect your immigration status and will result in deportation just as a conviction at trial would. And this is true regardless of any advice by your attorney or anyone else. Yes. Do you understand about pleading guilty to a felony if you use, receive, possess, or transport a firearm or use a firearm in a crime, you will be guilty of a felony which may carry a sentence of one to 15 years in prison. Yes. 
Are you asking to be treated as a first offender under the provisions of the First Offender Act? Yes. Have you ever pleaded guilty or no low contend day two or ever been convicted of a felony in the state of Georgia or any other jurisdiction? No. Have you ever been sentenced for any crime, felony or misdemeanor under the First Offender Act? No. Has your attorney explained the First Offender Act to you? Yes. Do you understand that if you violate the terms of the first offender sentence or commit a new offense while on first offender probation, your first offender status could be revoked, you could be adjudicated guilty, and you could be resentenced up to the maximum sentence for the charge in this indictment? Yes. Do you understand that you waive any and all defenses, including any mental health defenses, by entering a plea of guilty? Yes. Do you understand that if you went to trial, you will have the right to a trial by jury, the right to see, hear, and confront witnesses called to testify against you, and the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself? Yes. Do you understand that by pleading guilty, you're giving up the following rights, the right to a trial by jury, the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself, the right to confront witnesses against you, the right to the assistance of counsel hired by you or to court-appointed counsel, the right to the presumption of innocence, the right to testify on your own behalf and to present other evidence, the right to subpoena witnesses and compel the production of evidence, the right to have the charges against you proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and the right to appeal if convicted of these charges after a trial. Yes. Has anyone forced, threatened, or promised you anything to get you to enter a guilty plea? No. Is it your decision to waive these rights and enter a guilty plea because you're in fact guilty? Yes. How do you plead to the charge of theft by receiving stolen property in indictment number 20SC174728? Guilty. Is this guilty plea freely and voluntarily given with full knowledge of the charges against you? Yes. Do you understand that you only have a limited right to appeal this guilty plea conviction? Yes. Do you understand that you only have four years from today for a felony charge to file a habeas corpus petition challenging the voluntariness of this guilty plea? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Maskew. Um, Your Honor, the state is um, unaware of any felony convictions by this defendant. And had we proceeded to trial, the state would have proven that on September the 27th of 2019, um, there are multiple locations, uh, as you're aware, Your Honor, in this incident, but it was reported that at 521 Capitol Avenue, Southeast Atlanta, Georgia, in Fulton County, uh, Miss, Miss, um, I'm sorry, the victim called 911 saying that she was robbed at gunpoint by two um, males, two black males at the Blue Lot parking lot of Georgia State. Um, during investigation, officers learned that um, this was an incident that took place, but the location was not, the, the, the victim um, lied multiple times about the location in which this incident happened. Um, this actually happened in Little Five Points, which is um, APD's jurisdiction. Um, during the investigation, um, the officers were able to track a laptop computer that was taken from the victim's vehicle during this incident um, to Mr. Mazakew's home. Um, when they searched that home, they never recovered that laptop, um, but they did, um, they did see the vehicle that was used in this incident parked outside of his home. Um, they sent this information to the victim. The victim was able to um, point out that or identify that vehicle was being the vehicle that was used or the defendants got into after the robbery took place, um, as well as she did um, identify the defendant in a photo lineup. Um, the, the officers took the defendant down to um, APD to question him. I'm sorry, he was not, he was taken down to agency and questioned about this incident. During the time that he was in custody, an officer did observe him communicating with the co-defendant that was also uh, related to this case, Mr. Willibus. Mr. Willibus sent him a text message telling him to keep his mouth shut. Um, phone records were pulled from um, officers so they could verify the communications between both of the defendants. Um, the co-defendant was eventually arrested and an interview was taken with him. He was able to inform officers that in fact, they knew this victim 
and that they were going to meet her to purchase THC um, vape pens, um, at which point when they got in her vehicle, um, she pulled a gun out on them and tried to rob them. And um, in his statements, he said that they um, shot, one person shot the, shot the gun that they had to try to get away and leaving that vehicle, they did take her book bag. Um, the state, the state um, did when we get when we got this case, we did investigate. We did talk to um, most of the people that were involved, except for all the cross defendants, of course. Um, we did determine that we don't know exactly what happened inside of this vehicle, but that all parties were involved in the, tr the drug transaction of the THC pens. Um, and that's that's where we are now. Um, that is all from the state, Your Honor. Ms. Hall, I, I know you told me this before but I, I don't remember, something allowed law enforcement to figure out Mr. Mazaku's address. They were tracking the laptop or a phone or something? The laptop, the laptop that was taken from, the laptop was inside of the book bag that was taken from the car. And a few days after the robbery, Miss, um, Miss, um, Miss Tina, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. having a brain freeze. Yes. She contacted the investigator and said that she had remembered she had a tracking device on her Mac laptop. And when they, she gave the information to law enforcement, I told you last time we were in court, because that's what I read in a report, that it was tracked to her, his, the defendant's, Mr. Mazzucchio's brother's house. But after re-reviewing this information and talking to defense counsel, it was actually tracked to his home. And that's where um, the body cams and everything picked up the recordings and stuff. So it was actually at his home, but they never recovered it. Okay. Well, that was the part I was getting at. So, um, the, the tracking device got law enforcement to Mr. Mazaku's home, and yet they didn't find anything with the tracking device at his home. They didn't find the actual laptop, which, I mean, they tracked it from the house for a, a, a time period of four days from like the, the Friday of the incident or when the incident happened up until the next week. But when they actually got out there, they couldn't locate the, the actual laptop. But it wasn't... When I was watching the body counts, it seemed to be because it's a home. So in a home, there's so many different sure. places. So they they even mentioned that on the body cam, like we, it's too many places to look. So they just didn't locate it. Okay. And not to say that it was there or not, they didn't locate it. So. Got it. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, again, and thank you for all your work on this case. Uh, mm -hmm. I know it's been a handful. Um, Ms. Crawford, welcome back. Um, we've shifted gears. Um, we're dealing with Mr. Mazaku now, um, who is position eight uh, on the calendar. Do you have any adult criminal history for Mr. Mazaku? No, Judge. He doesn't have any history. No history found for him. Thank you. Um, and off the record, um, did you sort things out with Mr. Williams? Is this going to work or is it going to be complicated? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is um, make it to where he does not have to come back. Um, I'm going to need his pol the police report and some his sentence sheets, email that over to probation, and they'll reach out to him along with the $100, $100 money order. And once they reach out to him, if they can get everything situated, he won't have to come back on Monday. Okay, so I can still sign the final disposition today. And if he can take care of business, he doesn't need to come back. If he cannot, then he'll be there on Tuesday. That's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Hendrickson. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. You've done a lot of work on this case as well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a handful, as, as you said, Judge. Um, I, I want to, I guess if it's okay, I do want to discuss some of the facts because not that it changes necessarily anything, but I know Mr. Mazaku, I can feel him uncomfortable uh, with the state's resuscitation of the facts. And, and I, I certainly would just like to, I guess, weigh in on a couple of those issues. Uh, but I also wanted to point out, so Your Honor could be thinking about it. One of the other things that kind of, two things put us over the hump to get to this point this morning. Uh, one was Ms. Hall uh, agreeing to shift this to a theft by receiving. I believe Mr. Willow has pled to a theft by taking, I think. Uh, and secondly was, uh, I had asked her about the possibility of early termination, which she agreed once restitution is paid. So those would be the two things that kind of got us to where we're at. Sure. Actually, um, oh, sorry. On that note of early termination, Mr. Mazzucco, you should understand, um, I don't control that 100%. Partly early termination is driven by you. You'll need to stay out of trouble and be paying the restitution. If you take care of those things, then it's appropriate 
for Mr. Henriksen and probation to come to me to say, he's been doing great, model probationer, still in school, working, whatever you're doing, he's paying probation, then we can certainly think about doing early termination. I just don't want you to think that it's guaranteed. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Judge, on the, with respect to the facts, um, the reason we've sort of had some hesitation in getting here, uh, I have looked at the police reports, I have reviewed three different interviews with the alleged victim. Uh, I may, I'm not sure if Ms. Hall has watched it, but I can tell the court that I watched every painful three hour, 33 minute and some odd seconds of Mr. Willowitz's interview. Um, in all of that information, I don't believe the state would be able to put my client in the vehicle. Ms. Wynn uh, described clearly Mr. Willowitz, he had the kind of flamboyant uh, red or bright purple dreads, which kind of did him in uh, as far as ID. Uh, a photo lineup was mentioned. My client, to my knowledge, in, in discovery that I have received, my client was never identified by Ms. Wynn. She did ID in a photo lineup, Mr. Willis. And then there was a mystery third person who, if I'm remembering correctly, Mr. Willis said, well, we just, we sort of met this guy and he was into the same thing, the gas station at Little Five, and um, that could be your source of the gun. But, but either way, um, someone not Mr. Mazatou, um, was a party to the failed transaction. That is that, that is, you got in the car. That's what Willibus said. It yeah. said Willibus and recently met guy, not mystery guy, but recently met guy. They got out of the car and went. Yeah, and your memory is exactly right. They okay. they uh, they tried, and when I say they, I mean investigator. I think Sumney and whoever else was in that room. This was a very hostile at times interview. They kept telling Willibus. That Mazuku was in the back seat. They didn't ask. They just kept telling him that's what it was. We know it's him. And every time they said it, and it, it had to have been between half a dozen and a dozen times, Willis said, no, he wasn't there. He didn't know anything about what we were doing. He didn't know anything was going on. Um, and so I wanted to sort of clear that because also that's corroborated by Miss Wynn, who just her physical description of the back seat passenger, who is the person who she says had the weapon, and Willis says had the weapon was a light-skinned black man. That's not your client. That's not my client. Um, she also- So where was Mr. Mazaku while the transaction is trying to happen? According to Willibus, he's in the car. Uh, he had driven them to this location and they got out. So Mr. Mazaku is a remember, he's wheels basically. He gets Willibus and mystery man to the deal location. That's they get out of Mazaku's car and get into Wen's car. That's what Wilda says. That's not what my client would say. But well, what would he say? And he's gonna, he would say he was not there. And now the computer, and this is why that we got to this second home. Miss Wynn describes a black car, and she's very consistent about a black four-door car. My client has a black four-door car. One of the things I was trying to get in discovery, and, and I know Miss Hall has uh, she's been trying her last week. We had a, a bunch of emails I wanted to let the court go to between Miss Hall and myself. Uh, and her legal assistant, I believe, Ms. Burks. I truly believe the DA's office was doing everything they can to get information that I was asking. Um, and her last email was, I've given you everything we have. Now, sure. And I know she had trouble, she missed all, because either someone from Georgia State got sick or with a, a, a holder of discovery on law enforcement side became unavailable and it was difficult to reconstruct things and or Things were written down well, and this happened. This was created, but it wasn't created. Things that maybe you thought you ought to be able to get, but one last. We just don't know if they exist. Like, for example, the co defendant Willibus's phone records. I've never seen those. I have seen Mr. Mazaku. Um, I will say to the court, at no time does his phone ping anywhere inside the perimeter the day of the on drive. Okay. Uh, no, that doesn't mean he wasn't there. Yeah. But his phone wasn't there, or at least okay. was not being used inside the perimeter. Yeah. Um, but I have not seen Will of this phone records, so I don't know if those exist. But the other thing I wanted to point out about the car issue was that one thing that's in the uh, investigator Sumney's report was that my client, or excuse me, Miss Wynn described a black four-door sedan with a green hood. And of course, at a, if we were to have a trial, I would present evidence that my client's car had photos of it, never has it had a green hood. So I think we have some arguments there. Now, the computer. Uh, my client would admit that he was given a computer. 
He tried it out. He had it for a day or two or whatever. Given the computer by Willis. Okay. And then gave the computer back because he didn't want to use it, didn't like it. And I will tell the court just candidly, my discussions with my client were simply this from the very beginning. This sounded to me like a theft by receipt mm -hmm. because arguably in front of a jury, I could certainly see Ms. Hall possibly convincing a jury that, hey, you knew or you should have known something was wrong with that computer. Why are you being given this computer? Right. What's the deal? And I've explained to him, I think he understands that. He recognizes that. And that was always my concern about this case. I always believed I could defend the armed robbery and I told him as much. Yeah. But I was very concerned about theft by receiving. When Ms. Hall offered us that this morning um, and offered the uh, early termination once restitution has been paid, we spoke. His mom, who has been religiously with him when we come to court and when he comes to my office, and we, I think we had two or three meetings over the course of the last 10 days, uh, we all feel that we have now reached a point where we can all feel comfortable. I know it's probably not what anybody really wants. The state's maybe not totally happy. Ms. Wynn may or may not be. I don't know. Uh, but we kind of reached a, a resolution and we would ask the court uh, to accept this plea and, uh, and sentence the court. Okay, appreciate you sharing that. Mr. Mazaku, how do you know Mr. Willibus? You share a mutual friend. You share a friend? Yeah, I met a mutual friend. Okay, a mutual friend. Yeah. Um, you're a student at Georgia State? I'm a student at Shelby, which is the college. Were you ever at Georgia State? No. Okay, Willibus may have been a student at Georgia State. I have no idea. You don't know. You met Mr. Willibus through the mutual friend. Yes. Is the mutual friend a student at Georgia State? No, I don't no. know. Him. Okay. You're at Chavage. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Do you have anything you want to add? Mr. Hendrickson has helped me understand um, your view of the case and your loose connection to it. It could be limited to um, in the form of Ms. Wen's laptop. You briefly had at your house. Anything you want to add? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, well, I find there's a factual basis for your plea to theft by receiving, meaning you for a while were knowingly holding property that wasn't yours and had been taken from someone else. And it was reasonable for you to assume that it, it probably was a story. I also find that your plea is knowing and voluntary. Voluntary means that, well, you may not be excited to be here in court again. No one's forcing you to do this, but that you've decided after thinking about it a whole lot, talking about it with your lawyer and with your mother, that this is the right way for you to move forward. Do you agree with that? Okay. And a knowing plea is simply one where you've understood all the things that Ms. Hall was explaining to you. Do you feel like you understood what she had to say? And I'm going to accept your plea. I'm going to sentence you under the Probation Options Management Act. You've heard me describe this to many people now, but it's your turn. That just means that while you're on probation, if you have a technical violation, um, you, you miss a meeting or you test positive for marijuana or something like that, um, you and probation can sort that out. You do not have to come back into court. If you um, get arrested again for something, that's the kind of thing that would be a violation of probation. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I will sentence you as a first offender. Um, the benefit of first offender is that this is not a conviction. You don't need to go back to school and say, now I have a felony conviction. And you will not have a felony conviction as long as you successfully complete your sentence. That's the benefit. It keeps your record clean. It's real valuable. The risk is that if you get in trouble over the next few years while you are on probation, not only do you have your new business to deal with, but I could, if I felt that um, your new charges were supported by evidence, revoke your first offender status and resentence you without a trial because you've already said, hey, I messed up with this laptop. And I can sentence you to the maximum, which is five years in prison. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. So if you're pretty sure you're gonna stay out of trouble, this is a great deal. Um, but if you're not so sure how the next few years are going to go, if there are some risks. You feel like you understand the benefits and the risks? Yes, sir. Do you want to be sentenced as a first offender? Yes, sir. I will do that. Um, and I will follow the joint recommendation. Um, as to count four, which has been amended to theft by receiving, I will sentence you to three years probation. I will waive your supervision fees for the first six months because you're going to be focused on paying some of that restitution. 
The restitution is $1,500, but you owe that jointly and severally with Mr. Willibus. So every dollar he pays, you don't have to pay. Every dollar you pay, he doesn't have to pay. But ultimately that 1,500 needs to be paid. Um, so you're gonna pay as you're able. Um, there's not a set schedule, but the answer isn't that you pay zero. You need to pay some over time. And the sooner it gets paid off, the sooner you'd be in a position to say, hey, could I have my probation terminated as early? Because the answer will be no, if there's still some restitution that's owed. You'll give the money to probation. You don't have any contact with Ms. Wen. It sounds like you may not know her, um, but one of the conditions of your probation will be uh, no contact with Ms. Wen. Okay. You'll need to pay that restitution again. It's do jointly and severally with Mr. Willibus. Um, and um, as long as you are, um, are you a full-time student or a part-time student? I'm a full-time student. So I'm gonna change what I said about supervision fees. As long as you are enrolled as a full-time student, you don't need to pay the probation supervision fees. If you drop out of school or you just say, I'm done, I don't, I don't wanna finish, then you'll be expected to be working and you will need to pay the probation supervision fees. But if you're a full-time student, um, no supervision fees. I think that's it. Ms. Hall, anything else for Mr. Mascu? Not to further from the state. Do you have any questions about anything I've said, sir? No, sir. Mr. Hendrickson, anything else? I don't think there's anything else from the defense trial. So then the last thing is that this is your indictment. Um, and uh, normally we pass this around and you would sign it, your lawyer would sign it, but we're trying to limit it number of documents passed around. Do you authorize me, Mr. Master, to sign the indictment on your behalf? Yes, sir. Mr. Hendrickson? Absolutely, sir. And Ms. Hall? Yes, Your Honor. Great. I will do that. Um, you need to have a quick conversation with Ms. Crawford, who is with probation. Um, you just do it right here. It's going to be off the record, but she's going to appear on the screen in a minute. She's just going to need to get some contact information and give you reporting instructions because the next important thing you're gonna do in connection with this case, other than thank your lawyer and your mom, um, is to show up at probation so that you can start that relationship, okay? All right, so Ms. Crawford, Mr. Mascu's gonna stay here. He can move closer to the screen so you can hear him, um, but why don't you and he off the record have the conversation you need to have, okay?